Yeah. Hi everyone, I think we're live now to the Clean Energy Challenge webinar. We're dialing in from various parts of the world. A couple of us are in Delhi. Uh, we have our last year's winners, Rajiv and Surya, dialing in from Nepal and Sweden. We have the What Design Can Do team that's based in Amsterdam. And of course, the Unbox team that's here in Delhi. Thank you everyone for joining us live. Uh, this is the first time that we're doing the webinar also uh, with the intention of helping those who are looking to apply for the Clean Energy Challenge in Delhi. Uh, as you're all aware, we're about 15 days away from the close of the deadline um, and excited about all the great response that we're getting. We thought it might be useful to get together, uh, get a few of our finalists from uh, previous years and give you a chance to listen in on their experience, their projects, and perhaps be inspired by how you may shape your application. So um, I just wanted to run you through the structure of the webinar. We have about an hour uh, till 5.30 p.m. Uh, IST. The way we would structure the webinar is I'd begin by introducing uh, Surya and Rajiv. Uh, we would have then a presentation from each of the finalists uh, for roughly 10 minutes each. They'll be sharing details on their projects and how that has evolved over the last few years. We'll then open it up to questions from all those viewers who are online and uh, watching this. Uh, you are on a YouTube link that was shared with you. Uh, there is a chat window uh, that you would see next to uh, the live broadcast. That's where you need to type your questions. We have uh, a part of our team that's monitoring that. If there are any questions that are directed at the, uh, at the finalists or at any one of the team members, please post it in the chat window and then we will forward that to the finalists and for the rest of us to answer. So we'd have about uh, 20 minutes there and that leaves us with uh, roughly about five, 10 minutes to conclude the session where we'll share uh, some essential details on the challenge specifically for Delhi. Uh, so that's the structure of the session. Uh, again, uh, thank you to uh, the finalists, uh, to uh, uh, the What Design Can Do team for joining us. So let me begin by introducing uh, Surya and Rajiv. Uh, Surya uh, is a mathematician who's been managing the ICE Tupa project for the past three years studying the life cycle of ice tubers through field measurements and dynamic models. He joined the project as an apprentice to Sonam Wangchuk, the dynamic and brilliant Ladakhi leader, as part of the India Fellows Program in 2015 and was part of the application process to the 2017 Climate Action Challenge. He's currently developing the project in Peru, Switzerland, Nepal and India, and he's dialing in you could perhaps say hi to the audience, uh, Surya. Oh, is that okay? Hi, everyone. Great. Thank you once again, Surya, for joining us. Uh, we also have Rajiv, who is the co-founder and environmental director of KTK Belt Project. He's a graduate of Brown University, uh, the Univ New York University School of Law, and has recently received a master's in agriculture at Cornell University. He's a lawyer, activist, rural development worker, and former Peace Corps volunteer. Between 2008 to 2011, he was the national coordinator of the Push for Peace Corps campaign. He is also the author of The Springs of Namie. The KTK Belt team proposed the winning idea WDCD 2017 Climate Action Challenge, building an 8,000 meter vertical university in eastern Nepal to help rural farmers adapt to variable change in six identified climatic regions of Nepal from the tropical plains to the Alpine Himalayas. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, we believe you're joining in from Nepal. Uh, thank you once again for uh, giving us your valuable time. Yeah, thank you and hello everyone. Thank you, Aish. Great. And, uh, and then we have uh, Rosa and Lara from the What Design Can Do team uh, based in uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands. They are 
right now as we speak part of the control room that has the buttons on all the five challenges that are running in five different cities uh, and uh, they are the team working tirelessly towards uh, bringing this challenge to all of you uh, who are interested in applying. Thank you once again Rosa and uh, Lara and the extended WDC team for making this happen. Uh, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> nice to be here. Great. And then there is uh, there's Anchal, Abhimanyu, and myself. We are all based in Delhi and part of the Unbox team that's leading the challenge uh, in Delhi and CR. Uh, hi, everyone. So without uh, wasting any more time, I am going to pass the screen to uh, Surya to begin the presentation. You have about 10 minutes to share your project challenge and uh, you know how it has shaped over the years. So over to you, Surya. Yeah. Thank you, Abhimanyu. Uh, I'll be sharing the project in an interesting way, which is basically first, of course, uh, I have to introduce the region where the project started, and that is Ladakh in northern India towards China. And uh, the region, as you see here in this image, it's a uh, cold desert. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, people here uh, are only restricted by water to grow their villages. So this is an actual image that you see here. Uh, the village at the center and the desert surrounding it and so it's always been a challenge for people here to get enough water oh, yeah. for farming yes sorry just a second i think we are not able to see the screen yet could you okay. share your screen i am sharing my screen i think it takes time to come to refresh Perhaps uh, you could try refreshing. Yeah, uh, one sec. Maybe yeah, we got it. I think it's on now. It's coming? It's coming? Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah, so as I described, this is a typical village in Ladakh. And this, uh, the, you know, the village which is highlighted here by the green colors and the surrounding desert. And uh, the ch it's always been a challenge for people in this region to get enough water for farming, to expand their villages. and. Uh, it's uh, one of the innovative ways that they uh, were uh, trying to develop was to store water in the form of ice. Why ice? Because uh, the region in this uh, case, uh, in the winter, goes to minus uh, 30, minus 40 degrees Celsius, and uh, and uh, they can freeze water. So it's basically a way to store water uh, as ice that they were trying to develop for the past 40 years. What happened recently uh, in this process of developing this? technology of water storage technology is this new idea of storing these ice structures in the form of form of conical structures and here i'm going to show you exactly what that what i mean by that so this is a, a time lapse of a conical structure this is uh, cgi right now it's not the uh, real process but i'll go into the real process later surya so, i think that's your screen again i'm sorry for yeah, the okay. But it may be uh, if you change the screens too fast, it may not refresh. So perhaps you uh, need to just pause on the slides for a bit. Yeah. Uh, let me know if when you see the slide. Is the slide visible? No, I'm not. No, I'm not able to see it. Yeah. Anyway, so what you're going to see is basically. Uh, the form, the process we use to form to convert water into ice, and it's uh, as shown in the slide, which you'll be seeing soon. Is there's this vertical pipe which basically brings water from the source, which could be the glacial stream, which could be the glacier itself, and to the location. In this case, a desert. Uh, and this vertical pipe has a fountain on the top, and that fountain dis distributes the water into droplets, and those that those water droplets get exposed to the ambient. Uh, cold te cold temperatures and freeze. Okay. Sorry, just yes. a second. Uh, sorry to pause you again. But perhaps uh, if you uh, exit the full screen mode, it might work. Okay, I will try another way. That's better. Exactly. So yeah, uh, do not go into the full screen mode. I think it will okay. work. Well. Yeah. Okay. So here you see a time lapse of the actual process in action. Is everyone able to see the video? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, so as I described, this is the process which we use to uh, convert water into ice. And this is the actual structure here. As you can see, the, this, uh, the activity that is happening right now is the village getting together to plant around 5,000 trees across the, uh, the bottom of the ice structure. And these trees, this, is, this was done in 2015, uh, in around March. And uh, they are still surviving uh, using the water of these ice structures in the critical period of April and May. Uh, so the idea behind this whole uh, technology is uh, to uh, provide extra water uh, uh, during the months of April and May when the demand of water is highest uh, for farming. And uh, this is like, uh, could be imagined as a, a personal water storage uh, medium for a farmer. So as shown, as I showed in the video before, uh, the process involves four steps. One, you have a pipeline from the source to the location where you want to build the ice structure. Second, you have uh, this vertical pipe with the fountain and this fountain distributes the water into droplets and those freeze in the winter. And then uh, you have uh, in the summer when, this, uh, when the temperatures are high enough, the ice structure melts and uh, it's distributed through a drip irrigation channel to the farm that needs the water. Uh, so this is the basic water, the technology that was developed. Uh, what happened later is interesting that uh, this was not, didn't, it didn't just remain a technology, it, remain, it went into other medium. So it was when, when the first ice structure was built in the village, and it started showing results, people started to see it as a religious entity. So yeah, like it's shown in this image, uh, basically these are prayer flags that the people uh, laid across the ice structure. And uh, yeah, and basically they started worshiping it. There was the religious leader of the, of the area who came and conducted prayers of the ice structure. And the villagers basically started seeing it as a, a part of their religion and they named in fact the name ice stupa originates from the buddhist religion uh, where stupas form the symbol of buddhism and yeah so it was kind of named by the local people themselves going further uh, this this started also becoming a big attraction not just inside the local region but for people uh, abroad for people across india and uh, there were a lot of tourists and interested villages who came saw the ice structure saw it in action and uh, and you know it it became something that the village became proud of that they invited guests and uh, other villages to showcase and this was an interesting develop development because uh, this the, the village that i'm talking about it's not a very popular village it's a small village in the middle of nowhere and for a small village in the middle of nowhere for around 1000 people per day coming it's a big thing and it completely changes uh, you know all the activities uh, that happen in the village another thing that happened for, during the course of the project is uh, it started uh, gaining attraction as a as a symbol of climate change and right now we we are working also in the region of switzerland actively and there as you can see in this image, there are student groups that come and build ice structures hands-on. And this is done through many different ways to do this. But in this particular case, you can see these twigs, which are used to form the framework or skeleton of the ice structure. And then the water freezes on them and starts building up. Uh, yeah, so it has become a teaching aid in a way uh, for students uh, in the region of Switzerland. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, they're around. In this winter, there were around around more than 300 kids who came, participated in this activity, and you know get to experience uh, not just farming guys, but to see the bigger picture of how climate change has affected different places in a in a different manner. The last the part which I am going to come into is the science, and uh, this ice structure is of course uh, uh, it's ice after all, and it's interesting in the, in, the, in, the, in the perspective of science to study it uh, you know, as an as a artificial glacier in a way to call it. But of course, it's not comparable to the size of a glacier, but it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a symbol in a way. And uh, it's something that could, in, it, that could progress science uh, towards understanding glaciers better. And this is something which I am more involved in and uh, that is happening across the world right now. Uh, so 
yeah so what i wanted to get across is the is the interesting uh, manners in which different parties see the same idea develop and this this can you know it 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 can bring together people from, from all across you know occupations like sculptors architects engineers scientists villagers farmers and and that in a way is something which always surprises me uh, and has surprised me throughout the progress or throughout the time i have been involved in this project yeah i think that would be yeah thank you surya thank you so much uh, maybe just a quick question uh, before we move on to rajiv is yeah. uh, where are you sort of headed with this uh, project uh, as we speak today yeah so right now i am uh, as i said uh, more involved in the research aspects of the project so i am pursuing my phd right now in switzerland and uh, i am involved with glaciologists across the world to uh, basically uh, implement in measurement strategies across the ice structure uh, as you see here it's uh, there are three aspects to this is the water flow in the ice structure the weather conditions that are required to form the ice structure and the shape of the ice structure itself how it contributes uh, in preserving the ice structure so basically i am in more uh, i am involved in the scientific aspects of the uh, of the project right now all right great there i think there seem to be two questions so maybe i'll kind of break from the format i had earlier suggested and just take these two questions quickly yeah. uh, so the one is about how these structures are created and what is really the energy source okay yeah i didn't get into that so uh, the uh, the energy source is gravity in a way so you have the uh, source of the pipeline which i showed if i go back to the slide here oops so i have to go there one sec i'm just going back to the slide uh, so if you see the can you see the slide anyway so uh, uh, the source of the pipeline is uh, uh, is on the uh, it's on near the glacier so it's at a higher higher at altitude than the uh, ice structure itself so you have the gravitational pressure from the top uh, to the bottom uh, which drives the whole process so there is no use of you know pumps or external energy in this case it's just done by gravity and that in a way is is the principle of the whole project because it's supposed to be uh, for climate change and we can't we should we have a principle of not using any external energy source yeah great and there's one other question which is what was the raking the the so called glacier at the place which already has lots of natural glaciers yeah yeah uh, that's a good question so this place of course has a lot of natural glaciers uh, the as i mentioned the problem with the the current problem to elaborate that is the glaciers uh, are not be uh, there's not much snowfall on the glaciers during the winter and this has uh, there has been a drastic change in the past 20 years if you just see the snowfall annual snowfall that has happened in this region and what that means is there is not enough snow to melt during the early months of april and may and when there is not enough snow that means the water volume that reaches the farmers when they want to uh, irrigate their land they, it's not enough so their demand is high during april and may but the supply is getting lower and lower and the reason to construct these ice structures is basically to match the demand and supply so basically for a farmer when in during april and may when he doesn't have enough water from the stream he takes the use of these ice structures which have stored water during the winter to farm in the plantations yeah got it got it i don't think there are any more questions at this point in time but perhaps if they come in uh, we will circle back to you surya and take those questions later so uh, thank you once again for sharing a wonderful project i'll move on to rajiv uh, rajiv if you could uh, share more about the ktk belt project sure thank you very much um and it's uh uh it's a very nice to meet all of you and to have this chance to um present uh, what we're doing and share about the experience that we had in the wdcd program so i'm just going to share my screen and i'm hoping now that it's working yeah uh, so. it is working okay fantastic so um yeah we can see it great so basically um our project is called the vertical university project we can see it rajiv yeah, yeah. okay great 
You can see it, correct? Yeah. OK. So our project is called the Vertical University Project. We are working in eastern Nepal. And basically, we're, our project responds to the fact that in a mountainous country like Nepal, where you move from sea level to some of the tallest peaks in the world, the manifestations of climate change and the nature of the different hazards and issues and opportunities is highly place dependent. In other words, a kind of one size fits all pro uh, strategy won't work in adapting to climate change. In the plains, people are experiencing floods, and higher up, it might be glacial lakes bursting. And so, um, basically, uh, you know, we asked the question: Well, you know, what could a single farmer, you know, uh, sort of at the complete grassroots level, possibly know about addressing climate change? And uh, you know, the project sort of stems from the fact that ordinary farmers in different villages across this gradient have this extraordinary knowledge about the biodiversity around them. And so we came up with this uh, concept. This rendering essentially shows um, what our vertical university is to look at, look like. So imagine uh, being at the plains in Koshitapu at 67 meters above sea level, uh, which is the largest Ramsar site in an aquatic bird reserve with 536 species and imagine learning about all of the different birds, uh, species like the Arna, the wild water buffalo, uh, from the local farmers themselves. And then moving further up, you get to Yangsala, which is this uh, amazing habitat in the Shivalik range from 180 to 1950 meters. And here the idea would be that you would learn about uh, all of the biodiversity found at this node and how people are using this biodiversity to adapt to change around them. And going further up to a place called Kurule, uh, which is the third uh, sort of node or campus of the vertical university, where uh, 150 springs have died in the last five years, mainly due to climate change and land use change, and trying to understand, well, what, you know, what are ordinary people sort of doing to adapt to this loss of water? So here, the campus would be all about water and the biodiversity of the Thummer River. And coming further up, you get to the fourth campus of the Vertical University, which is a rhododendron forest that's highly threatened by sort of roads being widened, um, illegal logging, and other unsustainable activities. So here, uh, the, the work would be about the 28 out of 32 nationally found rhododendron species and the red panda that are found in this habitat. And then finally, you arrive at a place called Tudam, which is uh, the highest node of the Vertical University which is this incredible uh, snow leopard habitat full of rare medicinal plants, between 900 and 1,000 different flowering plants found in this one uh, so area. And so, uh, and then at last you get to the, uh, the foothills of Kanchenjunga and the last campus is, is all about glaciers. You know, people come to Nepal from all over the world to study glaciers. They do their PhDs study these landscapes, but the Nepali kids don't really know about what's happening to glaciers um, as a result of climate change, or even what are glaciers. And so um, in terms of like sort of what we've achieved, um, you know, that's kind of the vision of the project. The idea is to create this continuous uh, biodiversity corridor from the plains to Kanchenjunga, the third tallest peak in the world, comprised of these six campuses to teach about biodiversity and indigenous knowledge. That, in a nutshell, is our project. And in terms of sort of what we've achieved already, we, uh, through the WDCD program, and subsequently, we've um, created six partner organizations. Um, we, last year, employed 106 people in this project, showing that biodiversity conservation can be a major job creator. 48% uh, of our staff are women, and 86% are working in the communities where they're from. Um, as a result of the accelerator program, we really um, sort of pushed forward on our outdoor education program. So linking sixth to eighth graders um, to these uh, different uh, campuses and, and bringing them out into nature. So we've really activated that program. Um, and then we've built, uh, you know, this uh, structure, which is made of uh, shipping containers, which is houses our outdoor education program. We've created sort of other um, architectural structures that are kind of rooted in the local vernacular. Um, and then um, my co-founder, Priyanka Bista, who's an architect, she leads our local builder team. And, and these are the kind of local people who are actually building the 
vertical universities. So the idea is not to bring in, you know, star architects and super designers, but to create jobs and have local people really build their capacity and build the vertical university together. Um, we have broken ground on one campus um, since the accelerator program, which was last year. Um, we are about three fourths of the way done with the uh, structure you can see here made of rammed earth, which is gonna be the third campus of the vertical university, all about the aquatic biodiversity and the water uh, issues. We also kind of have um, worked with, uh, through this program on a revenue model, which is what we call the vertical farm. So we've, uh, we have 386 raised beds. We're doing biointensive farming, producing 150 different varieties of fruits and vegetables. The farm employs 10 people, including single mothers um, right now. And then the other big thing that just recently happened, I'm actually just back from that trip, we have now shot um, a film about all six of the nodes of the Vertical University working with a group called Nature Needs Half and a filmmaker, um, Nate, uh, James Brundage. So we went to this extraordinary uh, landscape at sort of uh, 3,000, 4,000 meters and helicopters and just shot this. Um, so we now actually can tell our story with video and sort of what the project is all about. Um, our big uh, achievement has been that we, you know, we do land preservation. So KTK Belt helps purchase land and put it away in trust and perpetuity before the land grabbing and a habitat uh, sort of degradation starts to happen. So we now, um, you know, have really expanded our land trust and are working with um, the Rainforest Trust uh, to create a 176,000 uh, acre protected area at the sort of highest node of the vertical university, which will kind of be like our biggest um, sort of a living landscape. Um, I just show you this slide to show you sort of what we came up with through the program, which was really focused. Priyanka and I were extremely focused on how do we sustain this project and how do we make uh, revenue for it in, within our nonprofit model and true to you know the values of the project, um, so that you know the vertical university. Um, survives 10, 20, 50 years from now. So we developed this model. I'll just quickly share it with you. Um, and the, you know, we also kind of went, kind of deepened our identity through the program. I think that was for me the biggest value was we really um, started to understand. Okay, we, we're really about you know this university and these six nodes, and um, you know we can actually uh, sustain this project with while staying within you know our values of biodiversity first and those types of elements. So, um, and then we kind of defined an end state of, you know, so what, where, where is all of this going and what is our sort of end game of the project, which is articulated in this slide, I won't go through it. And then, yeah, so this is our vertical university. I'll just, um, I was just gonna share with you a little clip from the uh, recent filming. Uh, this is a drone um, image that was taken in my last minutes and then I'll quickly stop just to show you kind of some of the raw, very raw footage that we uh, took of some of these landscapes that we're protecting, which are gonna be, uh, you know, these are essentially the living campuses of the uh, vertical universe. This is a place called Papung. It's the kind of the Kanchanjunga node, the highest node. And this is a uh, lake called Chotanka. I think we were at uh, uh, 4,230 meters here. So anyway, I'll just stop there and, uh, Thanks for listening um, about the project. Thank you, Raji. It's, uh, I think you know the manner in which KTK Belt has continued to present its work. Taking have been a personal admirer of the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you once again for sharing uh, just uh, your wonderful stories. Uh, I'll just see uh, if there are any questions from uh, on the channel. Uh, give me just a second. But just how they are funding. Can you copy? So I think uh, I, I mean just sort of one question, uh, which I'm I'm guessing uh, is often asked of you is uh, how do you ensure uh, sustainability of this uh, venture? How are you funded, and what are different ways in which you've explored raising that? Mm -hmm. Um. So. With, with our project, I think that is really, that's really been the challenge because when you talk about um, biodiversity, you know, it, it, it's actually very complex to generate revenue without, um, 
you know, essentially, uh, you know, leading to monoculture or sort of degrading the values of your project. And so, uh, you know, basically what we came up with was actually two kind of big meta strategies. The first was we realized that we work in these six nodes and um, we developed this kind of 80-20, 80 20 model, 80% 80 of the land that we're conserving and the habitats trying to keep it in deep wild, you know, as far as possible, kind of zero human footprint state. And 20% of the land, which is kind of more cultivated, has agroforestry. Um, I, you know, the idea there is that we just do, we, we develop organic products, you know, and we employ local people. And we, we've kind of developed this idea that we're, we're trying to further now of uh, kind of doing organic ag agriculture and doing with delivery and things like that. The second piece that kind of fits with diversity, because that's really the linchpin for us, is that it needs to generate revenue so that we can sustain this project independent of grants. Our goal is 2022, was to um, think about kind of ecotourism. Uh, but then tourism also leads to more footprint. I'm sure, you know, Surya, Steam is also kind of working through these questions. And so we're, we're, we're trying, we came up with through the What Design Can Do program, this idea of like focusing on nature-based education. So it, it's still kind of in the vein of tourism, but it's more, it's really about what we are, which is come learn from the farmers about their indigenous knowledge, um, be humble, enter this space and, you know, be willing to kind of learn their knowledge and, 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 and respect what they know and, and trying to monetize that. So we're in this, uh, so that's kind of the sustainability and we are in a kind of capital, uh, you know, campaign trying to, we, we have to first build the campuses so you, you actually have your foot on the ground and you actually have a home for these six different nodes. So we're trying to raise, you know, quite a substantial amount of money right now to build that infrastructure. And then, uh, but all, all the while we're trying to launch these sustainability pieces now so that revenue is trickling in, even if it's like one rupee, it doesn't matter. It needs to start and then just kind of snowball. So, uh, but we do get asked that question a lot, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, there's another question that's just come in, which is what were the reasons to choose that place for your research project? And what were the challenges uh, faced during your research? Mm -hmm. Is this with the, is this for me or for Surya? Uh, this is for you, uh, okay. Rajiv. Yeah. So um, the the hypothesis of the project is that if we're going to do conservation in the Himalayas, we have to think about the go really be deeply place based and think about this gradient. So in defining the six regions, we focused on eastern Nepal because eastern Nepal has a lot more precipitation than the west. It has a higher species density. It has a very high cultural richness, a lot of indigenous groups, um, a lot of uh, also extraordinary landscapes across this gradient. And then we pick the, the six different nodes on the basis of, they had to be divergent enough from each other. So if you go from Koshitapu, which is kind of like almost at sea level, then, um, and then you get to you know, the next region, which is the Pangolin region, which is totally different. So we had to have enough gap between them that they were touching different climate zones. And then it was also rooted in kind of work that Priyanka and I have done over the last like 10 years in Eastern Nepal relationships we have, like you can't just walk into any community, you have to have relationships and the community has to be interested in what you're trying to bring. So it's kind of organically grown and we have the six anchors and we're still figuring out how, it, how and where it connects on the basis of those factors. Got it. And, uh, and this is a question to both you, Rajiv and Surya, uh, because on the subject of sustainability and perhaps bringing this back to the challenge that's currently live, uh, which is the clean energy challenge, uh, the, to what extent and you know, how uh, far had you thought through this issue at the time that you put in kind of this project as a submission uh, for the WDCD challenge last year, you know, in terms of uh, funding, business sustainability, because that's something that I'm sure applicants uh, are thinking about, right? They may have a great idea, but they may not have thought through the sustainability of it. So maybe some insight on it, perhaps starting with you, Rajiv, and then uh, to Surya. 
Yeah, I mean, just quickly, I think on that question, um, when, when we had the, you know, when we participated in the challenge, it's a very competitive challenge. Um, I think, you know, generally what I felt was what, people were really excited about our idea. And it was only when we kind of talked about um, indigenous knowledge that it kind of clicked, I think. I saw it when we did the, we did a kind of FaceTime interview from Nepal. And when we explained like the power of indigenous knowledge on how that was what was driving it. Um, so I guess my general advice for people applying is to really go into like your emotional core um, and also back that up, but also like, why are you doing this? And what is it that you're passionate about to really articulate that? But But then on the kind of revenue side, we were really grilled on those things too. And even before we started the program, they wanted to understand, well, one of the criteria seems to be like, well, you know, why do you need this program? And like, what is it you're trying to do in terms of your sustainability that this particular community, community can help with? So I would really like crystallize like one or two things that you really hope to get out of in terms of building your revenue model. And the more you know about that, then the, the you know, people like Maxime and Dagan and uh, Xander and all of them were really helpful in like moving us towards that. Thanks, Rajiv. And Surya, perhaps from your point of view? Yeah. Um, our So when we joined the Pro Climate Action Challenge, it was uh, like we were already well ahead in the way of, you know, the, the team, in the perspectives that we had. Uh, but we were progressing towards all the goals that we had set through as a social organization. And uh, when it comes to revenue, uh, revenue model for a social organization, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's 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 something which uh, you know a lot of social organizations don't so, so much uh, ask many questions on that and this uh, the pro this challenge uh, across the challenge we had uh, a lot of new questions that we encountered and we had to discuss across the team and there were a lot of new insights into uh, some basic questions like uh, what, who who among the amongst the world would uh, uh, would require our solutions and what is the scope of it and uh, how can we uh, make our solutions more approachable, more uh, reachable for other people. And these are questions that uh, we were not yet ready to, uh, uh, we, are, we were not yet uh, given enough time to uh, discuss. And this kind of uh, broadened our scope of discussions. And uh, yeah, and at the end of the day, we had to, uh, uh, yeah, we had a, quite a significant uh, uh, viewpoints on uh, these these kind of questions yeah thank you surya and this is a, there's a question uh, for the wbcd team so rosa and lara perhaps you could take this uh, the yeah. question is can we avail further funds from elsewhere once the project is uh, chosen um yes well um sure that's the whole idea i think uh, because uh, what we are doing is uh, a project is chosen and then we have a, an amount of money to uh, help develop it and also this acceleration uh, program but during the acceleration program you are encouraged to find more funds to uh, further develop it so that's the whole idea is to get more funding um, and funds to uh, to work with yes yeah. Is it is it fair to say so? Of course, there is the there is the award money, which is anywhere between two and a half thousand euros to ten thousand euros, which is what WDCD provides as uh, the award. Uh, there is obviously an opportunity to present your project to a much wider global audience, and that in itself should raise certain interests uh, in perhaps uh, funders kind of approaching. So. Is it fair to say that the WDCD offers a platform that you leverage to actually find interesting funders, and it's it's likely that you will be able to? Yes, definitely. That's that's the idea. So there's an amount of money, there's the acceleration program, and there's the communication that we provide through our network and our platform. And also because um, this year the uh, the acceleration program is partly local and partly global in Amsterdam. Um, uh, we chose that path to also have a, glo uh, a local acceleration phase to, um, to enhance the chance that you find local partners and funding to uh, develop your project and, and implement it or, or uh, execute it. 
Got it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lara. Uh, there's a question that I wanted to kind of pose to both Rajiv and Surya. You know, uh, this is a platform that tries to celebrate the uh, the power of uh, social entrepreneurship and you know just innovators that are curious and driven to uh, create impact. On one hand, uh, on the other, also try to uh, explore the power of design, right? And that's why this platform is called What Design Can Do. Uh, could both of you speak to uh, what the relevance of design was in your projects, right? And how do you see that uh, changing the tone and tenor of what you actually ended up creating? Okay. You want to go first, Surya? <laughs> yeah, I can. Um, so, uh, I think there was a huge element of design. I think uh, so. The how our project started, as I mentioned, was in a in a in a context of a school. So we have a sustainable school in the region of Ladakh, and this was a small experiment that uh, began to give results. And uh, at, at the very step, at the very next step, we uh, we branded the project, you know, as I Stupa, and that's itself an element of design. It it brought the local community way 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 closer to the idea itself and that really helped us in establishing uh, the project you know the implementation site the people to help with to help uh, and the, you know the monastery got involved in the project and there were monks who were working with us daily there were villagers who were working with us there was the whole plantation of 5000 trees and all of this uh, came as uh, you know as a uh, as further steps just because we had this name, I Stupa, and people connected to the name, to the religion, to the religious symbolism, to the shape, and one example of how design changed the whole project. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll hand it over to you, Rajiv. Yeah, yeah. For us, I think um, you know what what we what we what we feel is that the conservation community and the design community are sort of like there's just a silo between the two and especially in like South Asia where we both work. Um, I think one of the things that's really missing in communicating and, and exciting young people about conservation and protecting nature is to, is to bring the design sort of lens to everything. So we see the, you know, we, we call ourselves KTK Belt Studio actually. And um, I'm not an architect, but my co-founder Priyanka is. And I, you know, so we do that. She, she and her team are actually designing these six campuses um, and also questioning like who does design? Is it just, you know, uh, kind of sitting in front of the computer or is it, you know, participatory with the communities? And that's something that Vertical University is trying to change, I think. Um, but then also, you know, being inspired by the biodiversity and nature in each of these six nodes, which is so sort of visually and in terms of all six senses, um, so incredibly important. And so how does that uh, biodiversity in those ecosystems kind of inspire the design? And then how do, how do those campuses then attract young people into thinking about conservation, not as sort of backward looking or preserving what's there, but as this really active and uh, you know process that's rooted in technology and in ind indigenous knowledge. So um, I think design is kind of, and, and I think, uh, you know, this group that we were a part of in the What Design Can Do, like, you know, with uh, Scrappy News and uh, 20 and all these amazing designers, um, I think that gave it a whole other energy because, you know, you have the kind of, some of the people like me, I guess, I don't really see myself necessarily as a designer, but um, I, lo I love design. I love being around designers where, and then some people were, you know, uh, design, they, they were they were like really kind of deeply artists and designers and had their own studios and that's what they did. So I think that that um, sort of uh, energy and space and then of course that the, the, um, the what design can do, the main event, the main stage and all of that was just like an explosion of uh, creative energy and connections. Um, so, you know, I think what um, Surya said at the beginning of his presentation, how you know, the Ice Stupa project is really open to like all these different disciplines. You know, I think in the same way, I think with Vertical University, we're, we're, we're trying to approach design from a really interdisciplinary and participatory 
uh, way and trying to create like platforms for, you know, these six nodes are really open platforms to create and design and solve challenges. So I, I don't know if that was clear, but that um, it, it's very simple in, in what we're doing. Got it. No, I think that's great. And perhaps maybe I'll just sort of add and co uh, comment that uh, is that, you know, I, for all the applicants there, um, I, I think the invitation is to look at design more broadly in terms of a couple of things that design espouses, right? One is uh, what you mentioned, Rajiv, is uh, participatory, collaborative. How do you involve the community and users in the process of what you come up with? And both of your examples, uh, I think Surya and Raji, one coming from uh, a place of deep knowledge around conservation and a deep passion about it. Uh, the other actually also coming you know, from a place of uh, sort of science and technology and really going deeper into uh, glacial formations and what those mean. Uh, I think the manner in which uh, you have collaborated with the community, Rajiv, to shape your project and Surya in the way that you have used uh, symbolism of design to actually give it some meaning. These are the ways in which I think the definition of design needs to be looked at. So it's not entirely necessary that you have to be a trained designer to be an applicant uh, in this challenge. I think you should be able to demonstrate that you understand the principles of design, which is around co-creation, which is around uh, a balance between form and function, which is about the end experience and how people who will be affected by your projects are actually going to experience it at the last mile at the moment of truth. I think that is what design kind of symbolizes. So uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic to kind of hear your points of view. Uh, I think we are we're kind of uh, nearing the end. We had just about 13 minutes. There are two questions. Uh, so one question is uh, that, and this is to uh, what design can do, is that uh, you know one of your solutions, Rajiv, yours is much wider. It looks at the entire sort of biodiversity of a region. The other, Surya, is a very local and focused solution. And the question to you, uh, uh, Lara and Rosa, is you know how does WDCD kind of uh, consider? What is the criteria that you consider? Uh, you know, and how do you award weightages to this, if any? Right? Is it okay to be very focused? Is it okay to be broad and wide? And uh, uh, just a follow-on from that is, what aspect is more important? Is it innovation or is it practicality? Yes. Okay. Well, to answer the first question first, ideally. Uh, well, uh, in this challenge, which is a little bit different than the one that uh, 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 Rajiv and Surya worked on, of course, we are now focusing on these five metropolitan areas, Delhi, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Nairobi and Amsterdam. So um, the ideas that are submitted need to be embedded in a way in these cities. So they have the folk, they have a local focus, but ideally any project that is being submitted is embedded locally but has the possibility to be scaled up in different areas as well um or like um yes well if that answers the question so um actually both are um could be awarded but you have a better chance at winning if it is if there's a possibility to bring it to a wider uh, spectrum to have more impact. That's, of course, in the end, is the idea to create as much impact as you can with your project. Um, um, and the other question was around innovation or practicality, Lara. Well, innovation in itself is not the goal. Um, so it depends on what kind of solution you have. If your solution is innovative and practical <laughs> and creates a lot of impact then it has um then it, it, it so the innovation in itself we, is not uh um, important if, if that answers the question uh as long as it is used to make a really good solution right if, and i guess i mean the the criteria that you have is that uh you would like to see these ideas implemented. And so 
practicality is an important aspect yes. right uh, okay. having said that if the idea is not innovative then you are not challenging status quo and status quo is what has led us to the kind of problems that we are facing so in short if i summarize your answer it is the need is for it to be innovative and practical right preferably yes <laughs> yeah okay fantastic and uh, we have a, another question which is if i have a campaign as a solution how do i submit the design is it like a graphic design or should, should i present the idea of the campaign uh, i think it's both really yeah so if you have the graphic design, then please, yeah, submit that as well. If you, for now, just have the idea of the campaign, that would also be enough, I think, for this moment. But of course, when we talk about design, I would say if you have already a mock-up or some graphic concepts, please uh, submit them as well. Yes, because if you submit, uh, you describe your project in a in 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 a short. Uh, um, uh, text and a longer text, also set in some images and a short video in which you explain it. And if every, every image or, or uh, that you have should be in there, I think, because you have a better chance at explaining it uh, well if you can visualize it, of course. Um, and yeah, well, that's yes. Can I just say something? Thank you. On that, even though the question was, yeah. I, I think it's also important um, not to get caught up in that. Like, am I design? Am I doing enough design? Am I more a campaign? Or I think the point of the whole exercise is that they're trying to broaden the whole idea of what design is as well. Um, because in our group, that one, there was one was like a television program. One was an app for uh, purchase. It called Ivaco, uh, you know, helping you shop better. Um, and then some are more explicitly like, you know, really, kind of what we think of prototypically as design. But I don't think that that, I didn't feel like that is something to get hung up on. Um, no. And, you know, and also the quality of the video, I remember we were quite stressed about that. So we submitted kind of something very raw, but that didn't seem to matter either. I think it was about communicating the idea and like really having it be compelling, you know, and, and yeah. make an impact, you know, I think is the key yeah. word. Well, thank you, because that's exactly the, the, the answer, I think, because like the innovation part, design in itself is not the goal. It is the, the instrument that you use to bring your idea across, I think, and to, uh, so, so don't worry too much about it yet. <laughs> that's something for also for a later stage, of course. And uh, so I, I think there is just one more question that's come in. We have about seven minutes to go. Uh, if the campaign is for policy change and has a limited life and not scalable, is that eligible? Um, it's okay. Well, that's that's <laughs> it could be very interesting, of course, but it's it. it, it we have um, a few uh, criteria that we judge every project uh, on and scalability actually is one of the things that is an important um, uh, criterion. Um, <laughs> so I think please do submit if you but also think about how this uh, how your idea could become uh, 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 scalable or having a longer life than just a one-time intervention or something like that as long that be, because the idea is if we choose you as a winner and we and you are given the money to develop it and work on this acceleration program that you create as much impact as you can so think about how you can make it longer lasting or scalable or something like that yes Got it. Okay, great. So I'm I'm going to kind of pose the last question. Uh, I think, sorry, should should we take this as the last question from uh, yeah. the viewers? There's one more that's coming. There is there could be a series of solutions that co-creates a solution for the city. Should I submit one by one or as separate projects or just one solution? I guess 
what they mean is that there are there are a series of ideas that could add up to kind of one larger solution for the city. Should they submit one or should they submit uh, just the you know the the the, the kind of uh, aggregation of all those uh, ideas? Mm. Well, that's a difficult question, I yes. think, because it, it, would they work separately as well? That's I think if if a, a solution in itself could work, then I might suggest to to send them in separately. If you think it's really a series that need each other, then you should submit as a series. I think it's kind of yeah. That's a fair answer. Yeah. yeah. Great. So uh, thank you. Uh, once again, everybody, it's 526. We have four minutes to close. I want to give uh, both Rajiv and Surya to share just a, you know, a, your advice for the applicants this year. Just one thing that you think would be really valuable for them. Uh, and then we will kind of close the session. So perhaps maybe Rajiv, you could start and then Surya over to you. Yeah, I think just briefly, I guess, reiterating what I said earlier, which is, I think, um, really trying to get at the core of what it is that uh, really is like kind of the, the the kernel, I think, of what your idea is. Even if it's like a really big or broad idea, if you can crystallize it in a way that um, it, it encapsulates like sort of the, the one unifying thing about your whole idea, um, that at least for us, that was a big challenge because, you know, we have this kind of broad project and, and for us, it ended up being indigenous knowledge. You know, that was the that was how the it's like the innovation we were bringing into thinking about climate change. So I would say that uh, would be one point. And then I I would also say um, you know that uh, the you know not also not to be afraid of um, you know does it have does it have enough design in it or is it innovative enough? But if it I I would really kind of look at impact because I think that the committee is really trying to under, like really looking for kind of world changing ideas, you know, and, um, you know, I, I would say also to put, put some work into making it look good. And that's another thing I would say as far as far as you can. Thank you, Rajiv. And Surya, any last word from you? Yeah. Um, so what I would like to stress is about uh, the audience, like, the kind of uh, idea that you're bringing across is it who's it for who do you think it is for and uh, you know just engaging with the uh, with the you know the ca the people that you are working for it's like you know just talking with them about the idea it could be a farmer it could be you know a, a mason it could be anybody so but just talking with them about the idea and seeing it from their perspective trying to understand the perspective of the audience that you're working for is very very important especially when you want to involve design in it uh, and uh, yeah it could it need not be you know you don't need to talk to a lot of people just a few people are enough to give you some kind of an idea and i think that would be a good way to develop your idea further and to contextualize it especially when you're talking about one city or anything so it's about talking uh, really living the life of the people that you're using their idea yeah thank you rajiv and surya i think uh, if i may add uh, sort of one last word or uh, what you guys have said uh, it is you know to bring the kind of passion that both of you demonstrate i think that's uh, that really shines more than anything else and even in the way that you've presented your work it's clear that you are committed to the cause and it's hard to miss that so you know if you bring that passion i feel like uh, you were already on to something really interesting and exciting. So I would uh, close just on, uh, you know, uh, reiterating what we have on offer and what just kind of five slides and what you guys should keep in mind, all the people who are viewing this. Uh, let me just quickly bring up my window. So, so what are we looking for? Uh, you do know that we are uh, you know, we're focused in Delhi on promoting clean and green building in Delhi. Uh, solutions that are, we discussed all of it, that are innovative, practical, scalable, affordable, easily understood. Uh, and these can be communication campaigns, products, spaces, services, systems. It's really very, very wide. So don't worry about whether your idea is designerly, uh, if I may put it that way. 
uh, it could be you know more than this uh, it could also be policy as one of the, one of you asked who can join uh, this challenge is open to students creative professionals and startups uh, why would you want to join us this is really your chance to create true impact uh, be a part of a global platform uh, there are several people and organizations that are connected to this and once you have your idea selected you're really speaking to a global audience which can bring sort of partnerships that you may not otherwise have access to so it's really uh, i think in that way it's really powerful uh, this is what we have on offer uh, the winning ideas could win anywhere between two and a half thousand euros to ten thousand euros but i think that's probably the least of the awards uh, there is a tailor-made impact development program that follows so if you are the finalist uh, in Delhi uh, you would have access to local mentors and accelerators who will help take your idea uh, to the market or you know bring it to the next level of realization and of course you will get to present your idea in the global stage at what design can do uh, in Amsterdam in March so that's uh, what we have. And finally, the deadline was extended. We have time until the 5th of December. So we would really encourage you uh, to put in your applications and uh, spread the word. It may bring in more competition, but it will also uh, make it more exciting in terms of the cohort that you will be talking to and you'll be, uh, you'll get a chance to interact with. So uh, thank you once again, everybody, for uh, joining us in this webinar. Uh, all the participants are also thanking the panelists for the session. I think it's been really informative. Thank you once again, Rajiv and Surya, for your time. Uh, a valuable one hour on your mission to change the world. So thanks once again. Uh, sorry, let me just stop screen sharing. Yeah. And uh, thank you, uh, Rosa and Lara, also for uh, making this happen in the first place to the entire What Design Can Do team. Uh, we'll touch base again. You have all our social media channels to connect to us on. If there are any questions that you have, please post us on Instagram, Twitter, uh, our Facebook kind of page, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks.